Hey, welcome back to the Road.TV Sermon Podcast, where today we're talking about the day to end all days. It's a fascinating topic of Jesus' return and the end of the world. In this message, Pastor Rick is going to shed a little clarification on the subject and look at some past Phil's predictions and highlight Jesus' own words from Mark 13. Whether you're new to the stream or been around, hey, we are glad to have you listening as we kick off this summer series. Now let's get this end of the world discussion going. Thank you for making the choice to worship at the road. Grab a Bible where it be in the gospel of Mark chapter 13. This is the first message in our summer BRP series. You say, what in the world is BRP? That's the Bible reading plan. That's what we do as a church. If you think, man, I'd like to be a part of that. You can pick up a copy of it at, at all the doors as you go out. It's just a little card. And every day we, we read one chapter. Uh, this next week we start in Mark. And so our, for the next six weeks of summer, we will be preaching on Sunday about a week that you are a chapter you're going to read that week. And this week you will read chapter 13 of the gospel of Mark, which by the way, is one, it, it covers one of the most controversial and, and uh, conflicting passages and topics in all of scripture, the return of Jesus Christ. Uh, and that's, that's really interesting because in the history of the church, Almost since Jesus walked this planet, people have been asking, when are you coming back? So you go all the way back to Acts chapter 1, and Jesus has been crucified. He's resurrected. Uh, he has not yet ascended. And he's talking to the disciples. The disciples look at him and they go, hey, uh, is this going to be the new Jerusalem? Is this the end of time? Are you fixing to set everything right? And Jesus said, what the most often given response of Jesus When asked the question, when is the end of time, was this. No one knows. The angels don't know. I don't know. Only my father knows. Then you move to the book of Thessalonians, and the Thessalonians had been taught of the imminent return of Jesus. That Jesus has been crucified, resurrected, time's going to end now. And when it didn't happen, they started to get discouraged. And question, was any of this true? And Paul writes to them to explain, hey, just be patient. Be patient. He will one day return. In the 1800s, there was a revivalist uh, by the name of William Miller. And he had calculated a specific date, April 3rd, 1843, that Jesus would return. He had 100,000 people believe him, quit their jobs. Some of them went on top of mountains, get this, because sometimes we look so dumb. So they would be closer to Jesus when he did return. What? What? Yeah, I'm sorry. Sometimes we amaze me. Herbert W. Armstrong, we're going to get a lot closer to home. You'll probably get uncomfortable before we're done. Herbert W. Armstrong, through the course of his ministry, submitted four different dates that Jesus would return. He did not. The fact that people kept believing him reveals our biblical naivete. Right? We just don't understand Scripture. Come a little further. Hal Lindsey, now I'm in some people's backyards now. Hal Lindsey was convinced Jesus would return in the 80s no later than 1988. He did not. A book was written in 1988 called 88 Reasons Jesus Will Return in 1988. He still didn't. Jack Van Impe predicted that Jesus would return in 2012. He didn't. The blood moon, don't raise your hand, don't point at anybody. (laughs) The blood moon of 2014, he did not. April 8th, the eclipse. (laughs) Right, it's getting really close to home now. By the way, I got some pictures, look at this. Just in case you think this wasn't, look at this, are you ready for the rapture? Because Jesus is coming. He did not. Now, now I want to pause here for a second. I want you to know that every time we do that, we look. Stupid, 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 stupid. Thanks. Look at the next one. You could go on on YouTube. You could find teachings about the reality of three days of darkness and why this is the end of the world. And in case you believed all of that, there was even a party. You could buy tickets to the end of the world party if that's what you wanted to do. So here's what I'm going to tell you. I don't know. If you think you know, don't come tell me. 
If you think you have a YouTube video of somebody who knows, please do not send it to me. Because the Bible says, and Jesus said, no one knows. No one knows except the Father, not even the Son. So what we're going to do today, we're going to work our way through chapter 13. And there are five things Jesus wanted us to see that apply to our lives today about the end of time. Would you pray with me? Father, I ask that you speak, make it clear, make it easy to understand, make it simple for us, Father. Um, And God, help us not to seek more than you reveal. Not to let us be a people fueled by pride in what we know. But Father, only to rest on what you have told us. I pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. First thing that Jesus tells us is he warns his followers not to become dependent upon visible signs as a means of spiritual security. Look at verses 1 through 4. As Jesus was going out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, behold, what wonderful stones and what a wonderful building. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another which will not be torn down. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew were questioning him privately. Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? So uh, this opens with Jesus leaving uh, the temple at Jerusalem. The temple was this incredible structure built about 19 B.C. by Herod. It's called the Second Temple. It was huge. It was on the top of Mount Moriah. And it was not, they didn't go in and level the mountain. They went in with these huge stones and built a foundation up where the temple was literally on top of the mountain. The historian Josephus tells us about some of the stones. And I call your attention to that verse where the disciple of Jesus said, not only look at the building, but look at these Stones. And some of those stones were 40 feet long, 12 feet high, and 18 feet wide. And if you read this scripture, Jesus has walked out of the temple and he kind of has turned and looking back. Scholars believe he walked out of the gate called Royal and, and walked across the Tyropian Valley. That's a valley of about 200, there was about 221 feet deep. It had a 354 foot bridge across it. On this bridge were these arches. These arches were 41 and a half feet tall. If you look back at the temple, there were solid marble pillars, 37 feet tall across the front. And then to beat it all, the temple was covered in gold. Now you understand when the disciple says, look at this Jesus. What an incredible structure. What a beautiful thing. The temple was the place where people worshiped. It was the place where people sacrificed. It was where they found their comfort and their security. And that became a problem. You see, men had substituted a physical symbol for a spiritual reality. Because they could see the temple... They felt good about their relationship with God. So Jesus warns his followers that the day will come, listen to this, the day will come when physical physical security and all that we have grown comfortable with in worship will one day be gone. I need you to hear this. That's where we're going to turn the corner. That what you and I, just like what the Jews had become comfortable with, what we've become comfortable with will one day disappear. It will one day disappear. Jesus prophesies this in verses Uh, 14 through 17, where he talks about the uh, desolation of abomination. And that happened in AD 70 when the Roman emperor Titus captured the city of Jerusalem. He built a siege around it, cut off all food and water. 97,000 people were taken hostage. And listen to this, 1.1 million starved to death inside the city of Jerusalem. That's why Jesus said, pray this doesn't happen in the winter and pray you're not carrying child when it does. Serious stuff. All that is left of that incredible temple when Titus got through with it is what we call the Wailing Wall today. So what do we walk away with? I mean, what was Jesus trying to tell us? Well, Jesus was trying to tell us, make sure you know the God who does not dwell in temples made with hands. Acts 17, 24. Because as the time of Christ's return nears, what is what we find our security in, what is comfortable for us, what is familiar for us will be gone. So I'm going to ask you some questions. What would your spiritual life look like today if there wasn't a church? 
You got up today and there was nowhere to go. Right, what, what, what would your worship look like if we didn't have a cool band? Or a new worship song every week, right? Because of Christian radio and all the people. What, what if none of that was available? What if there were no personalities in pulpits teaching? What if you didn't get your 28 minutes of God every week? What would your spiritual life look like? What if there were no online service? It's just gone. Because if I understand what Jesus is telling us, everything that we have grown secure in, here's a, a better way to say it. You've known nothing different than what we do for your whole life. It's been three songs and a sermon for as long as you could remember, for as long as your parents could remember, and as long as their parents could remember. It's always been the same thing. We've become the Jewish people. What's going to happen when it's all gone? And nothing you are familiar with and nothing you are comfortable with and nothing you are secure in exists anymore. What will your relationship with God look like? Second thing that Jesus warns us against is not to be deceived by false messengers. Look at verses 5 and 6 with me, if you will. Jesus began to say to them, See to it that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name saying, I am he. And he will mislead many. Then skip to verses 21 through 23. Here's what's going to happen. I don't have time to break all this down. Everything I'm going to show you in the first 13 verses is repeated in the verses after that again. Jesus basically said everything twice. So look at verses 21 through 23 with me. And if anyone says to you, behold, he is here. Uh, Here's the Christ or he is there. Do not believe him for false Christ and false prophets will arise and will show signs and wonders in order. Lead astray, if possible, the elect, but take heed. I have told you everything in advance. There's something in our hearts that makes us want to know more than than God has revealed to us. Um, Verse 23, Jesus is not saying he has told us everything that exists. What he's saying is this. I told you all you need to know. I've told you all you need to know. Rest in it. Uh, but we get consumed with wanting to know more. In Matthew twenty four thirty six, 36, uh, Jesus said the day and the hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son of Man, but the Father alone. So that same desire that drives us to want to run our own life. I want to do what I want to do. I don't want to do what God wants me to do. Also drives us to know what Jesus never told us. Pride. So that we can look at others and say, I see something you don't see or I know something you don't know. Keep the gospel message simple. It's a love story. And he who loves you is coming back. It is that simple. So Jesus looks at the people closest to him and he says, listen, what's going to happen is going to be so good that even some of you may fall prey to it. Some of the very elect. And he warns his followers that as time begins to unfold in the end years that some of us, right? So what would it take for you to be deceived? What would somebody have to be preaching or teaching for you to bite and follow error? There are two things the Bible warns us of. The first one is this, a convenient message, a convenient message. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So what is a convenient message? Well, it's a teaching that allows us to live our lives doing what we desire and not what Jesus desires. You see, we're prone to love a message that tells us what we already want to hear. That's when we get our amens. When we say what people already want to hear. And before you go all crazy about, man, yeah, churches, man, on alternative lifestyles and moral issues, let me ask you a question. Have you created a convenient gospel that you live by? I mean, when you start to look at what Jesus said about how we're to live, have you weeded out the things that didn't make you comfortable? created your own gospel have you done what second timothy chapter 2 verses 3 and 4 is talking about a gospel that you can live with 
Do you listen to people who teach us that God wants us to prosper because we follow him? That he wants to give us everything we want? Because if I understand what I have read about Jesus, he calls us to sacrifice and servitude, not prosperity and power. 1 Peter 4.17 says, For a time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. So look right up here at me. Before you get on your pedestal about what's happening on a national level, get on your knees about what's happening on a personal level. Are you with me? Salvation and judgment starts here on a personal level. Number two, convincing powers, that there will be uh, men, people who come doing wonderful signs, convincing miracles. Uh, Matthew 24, 24 says false Christ and false prophets will arise, show great signs and wonders. So uh, if possible, even to uh, mislead the elect. So convincing will be these powers that some who follow Jesus would even be swayed. Jesus is telling us this. Here it is in a nutshell. Why do we push the BRP? Why do we wish push staying in God's word? Because if you don't know the truth, you will fall for the lie. We learn the truth by staying in God's word, spending time in God's word. If we don't know the truth, then we're susceptible to the lie. Third truth, Jesus warns his followers, this is really good, not to be distracted by world turmoil. Look at verses 7 and 8. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. Those things must Take place. But the, that is not yet the end. For nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will also be famines. These things are merely the beginning of birth pains. So Jesus says there are two things that are coming that I want you to be watching for. And the first one is a world at war. And the second one is worldwide catastrophe. A world at war and a world falling apart. So let's talk about the world at war. The Geneva Academy tracks wars in our world today. Today, right now, there are 110 non-international armed conflicts and international armed conflicts happening in our world. There are 45 in North Africa and the Middle East, 35 in Africa, 7 in Europe, 6 in Latin America, and 21 Asian armed conflicts. So all that means nothing to you, but I'm going to show you something that should get your attention. This is a graph of war, war, wars and conflict in our world today. So I want you to see what happened about 2010. About 2010, there's this incredible spike in conflicts all over the world at about twice the rate that they had existed years before that. This is what Jesus is talking about. There, would you agree with me? There have always been wars. There always have been wars. Jesus is not saying, oh, because there's a war, he's saying this. There are two things you want to watch for. You want to watch for an increase in frequency and an increase in magnitude. And when you see that increase in frequency and that increase in magnitude, you better be ready. The second one is like that. That is worldwide catastrophe, world, a world falling apart. So would you agree with me? There always been earthquakes, always been hurricanes. Always been tornadoes in Oklahoma. All right. That is true. There always have been. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying as the end approaches, listen to what I'm saying, that the frequency and the magnitude of them will increase. There'll be more of them and they will be worse. Now, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to teach you truth and then show you science, show you fact. The Bible says earthquakes, famines, all that's going to, Increase Now what I'm going to show you is what science says about what's happening in our world today. The American Museum of Natural History state that the storms that are becoming in, Amer in our world today are more and more intense. The Environmental Defense Fund stated that the most damaging U.S. hurricanes are three times more frequently than they were 100 years ago. And the proportion of major hurricanes above a Category 3 in the Atlantic Ocean has doubled since 1980. Verse 19 says, in those days, affliction shall be such as was not since the beginning of creation. So I want you to see, simple as I can put it, wars and rumors of wars increase in frequency and increase in magnitude. Earthquakes, famines, natural disasters increase in frequency, increase in magnitude. Now, the phrase that Jesus used to describe this is the, the birth pains. That, that phrase in the Greek language is used two times. First time it's used when somebody's dying is that the closer you get to death, the more you hurt, right? A 20-year-old hurts, but you don't hurt nothing like a 60-year-old, right? Right? 
is that as you age, the pains get closer together and the magnitude of them gets bigger until ultimately we die. Right. And, and watch this. We talked about this a few weeks ago. We will welcome death when it comes. Are you with me? That the pain and the frequency and the magnitude get so close together that we will be glad death has come. That's one picture. Life ending. The other picture is life beginning. It's the same picture. Is that when a baby is born, you oh, I had a pain. A few minutes, hours later, oh, another pain. Frequency is far apart, but as the new life gets ready to begin, the frequency gets closer together and the magnitude gets bigger and bigger until they're happening one on top of the other and the pain is incredibly bad and then new life is born. So watch this. This is what Jesus is saying. The pain that is bringing an end to this life is ushering us into a new life. Same pain for one side, it means death. For the other side, it means new life. Incredible, incredible picture of what this world will look like as it's about to end. Number four, Jesus warned his followers not to be discouraged by unexpected hardship. Verses 9 through 13, follow along. Be on your guard, for they will deliver you to the courts, and you will be flogged in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. The gospel must first be preached to all nations. When they arrest you and hand you over, do not worry beforehand what you're to say, but say whatever is given to you in that hour. For it is not for you who, you who speak, but it is the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and father his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all because of my name, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. So first of all, there will be severe persecution for those who choose to follow Jesus. Uh, Jesus warns his followers of this impending imprisonment, severe persecution, beatings, and uh, those who will who will give up their lives for the, the cause of the gospel. Um, I want you to look up here at me, and I want you to understand why we are so unclear about what, what happens. Uh, we believe that the gospel was given to America. Um, the gospel was not given to America. It was given to the world. But when we read the Bible, we read it with our big old American goggles on. Right, And we interpret everything through our American goggles. And so, so we read about persecutions and we go, but they're not persecuting us. But when they begin to persecute us, the world will end. Well, how about this? They've been persecuting the world for decades and hundreds of years. It just hadn't come to your house yet. But look at me. If you believe what Jesus said is true, it's coming. And it's coming like a freight train. Are you with me? Is that we will not escape the persecution that Jesus talked about. So when we interpret scripture, interpret it from a worldwide perspective. So let me tell you what's happening in our world. 365 million Christians are subject to high levels of persecution and discrimination today. This compared to 340 million in 2021. Increase in frequency. Increase in magnitude. One in seven Christians are persecuted worldwide today. If you live in Africa, it's one in five. Can you wrap your mind around that? That if we have 2,000 people here today, 400 of them are going to be being severely persecuted. Unbelievable. Secondly, there will also be costly personal betrayal. Verse 12, Jesus warns a time will come when brother will betray brother and the end will be death. The fathers will betray their children and think they're doing the right thing. Realize this morning that Jesus said, because you have chosen to follow me, you will be the most hated people on, on planet earth. For the single decision of following Jesus. And then he says this, those who endure to the end will be saved. That's an interesting statement. It's a frightening statement. I believe the implication is a lot of people won't endure. They won't make it. If Jesus is just one more thing you've tagged onto your life and not the reason for your life, you won't make it. Just one more thing you do amongst the hundreds of things you do, you won't make it. If you have not prepared while time is good, and that is now, for when time is bad, you will not survive the bad time. That is why we push discipleship so desperately hard. Stay in God's word. Stay with people who are in God's word. And then lastly... Jesus gave his followers one final encouragement, and that was don't stop. Verses 32 through 37, we are done. 
Verse 32 says, heaven and earth shall pass away. But our verse, verse 31, verse 32. But the day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. So take heed. Keep on alert. For you do not know when the appointed time will come. It's like a man away, who went away on a journey, who upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigning each one to his task, also commanded the doorkeeper, you stay on alert. Therefore, be on alert, for when you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening, at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, in case he should come suddenly and find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to you all, be alert. So here here we go. So if I'm out there right now and I've listened to this whole message, I'm going, why? Because, Pastor, you opened with about... Ten different stories of people who were watching and waiting and thought they knew the time and got all ramped up about it and it didn't happen. Uh, and, and the truth is, if you've grown up in church, somebody, somebody that you know has been saying, he's coming back before I die. Right? Mamas and daddies, he'll come back before I die. Well, truth is, people have been saying that for a long time. Right? Long time. And I have people regularly come up to me and go, Pastor, I don't think I'll die before Jesus comes back. Oh, good luck. Yeah, good luck. Probably, probably going to die. Um, so why worry about any of this? So I'm going to tell you why these people miss these dates. Obvious ones, Jesus said nobody knows. But here's, here it is. Close everything and look at me. This is as simple as I can make it. They were looking at only one thing. They were looking at only one thing. You go all the way back to the early church, they were looking at personal persecution. And they thought because they were being personally persecuted that the end was near. But that was only one thing. It wasn't the entirety of what Jesus taught. The guy who set the date in 1843 for April 3rd, he set it based on one calendar date that he had calculated. One truth of scripture and that was it. And he missed it. Why? Because he was only looking at one thing and not the entirety of what Jesus taught. The 88 reasons Jesus was coming back in 88 was based off of this promise in Scripture. This generation shall not pass away till these things come to pass. A generation was typically 40 years in Scripture. Israel was reinstituted as a nation in 1948. 48 plus 40 is 1988. Surely this must be it. No, you were only looking at one thing. One thing. And you missed it. So we step back and we look at what I've shown you today. And this is what you see. More of what Jesus said is happening now with greater frequency and greater magnitude. Not one part of it. All of it. All of it is happening. Wars, rumors of wars, fear, infighting among people. Horrible natural disasters. More frequently. Greater magnitude. Than ever before. So what does Jesus say do? He says when this is happening. He said number one. Make sure you're ready. Make sure that you know. You have a relationship with Jesus. Look at me. I lived for many many years. Afraid. Fearful. Fearful. Praying the prayer a hundred times. Oh God. Please don't come back today. Because if you do. I don't know if I'll go to heaven. You know what the Bible says. That perfect love cast out all fear. If you are here today and you are afraid, that is not Jesus' plan for you. His plan is for you to have peace about this. And today you can get that peace. You can get it. The second thing is that the scripture says, listen, if you know him, don't get caught sleeping. Don't get caught sleeping. Um, There's a verse in Proverbs that says this, the son who sleeps in the harvest shames the father. When there's work to be done and you're in the family, the father has expectations. Don't be asleep when he shows up. Would you bow your heads with me? I I shared with the last service, I spent most of my life trying to manipulate people into following Jesus. And I found out while it's a great temporary uh, fix, it is not a long-term solution People who make decisions when they're manipulated don't follow through on them. So here's what I've tried to do today. I've tried to lay before you truth from God's word. And I've tried to lay before you a picture of what's happening in this world, right? A picture of what's unfolding around us right now. And I want you to decide what you need to do. 
I don't want you to make a fearful decision. I don't want you to make an emotional decision. I want you to look at what's put out there and go, this is what I need to do. This is what I need to do. And Matthew and Victor are here with me. And we would love, love, love to have the chance to talk to you about what it means to follow Jesus, how you can plant your life at this church and grow with this spiritual family. Father, thank you so much for our time together. I pray that your voice would be incredibly clear right now. And I pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, thank you for tuning in to today's message. If you found it encouraging, please consider sharing it with someone who may also need to hear it. For questions or prayer requests, feel free to email us at connect at the road.tv. For more information about The Road, visit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash the road CRBC or check out our website, the road.tv. Hey, thanks for being with us and may you have a blessed day.